Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo. If you're watching on YouTube, check out this awesome t-shirt, Kenny New York Giants. People have actually said it. Walking on the street, that was a dope t-shirt. Go, go, go check out the uh, ESM store for that. Um, but guys, awesome segment today for you, uh, talking about the three-headed monsters in the defensive backfield, our safety trio. How badass are they going to be? How badass are they? And what is the potential for them? You know, we got Logan Ryan, our esteemed stoic a leader back there, you know, a veteran with experience who's helped uh, some of these young guys transition to the NFL. Xavier McKinney, our young stud, um, a little pure breed from Alabama, really coming here and trying to help us in a variety of different ways. We're going to talk about his versatility. And of course, we have Jabril Peppers, our stud stallion dude can rock heads in the in the run game, but also drop back and cover tight ends and, and running backs in the flat. So this is, a, this is a trio of guys who have such different qualities. Um, they contribute in, in similar ways, but also different ways to help uh, cover up different weaknesses on this defense last year. But this year, a lot of these defenses were alleviated with the, uh, the acquisition of Adoree Jackson and a couple of awesome players. So I'm excited to talk about these three safeties, what they're going to do with them, how Patrick Graham plans to utilize them and the versatility that they offer and can contribute on a, on a weekly basis. But before we dive into this three-headed monster, my friend, Anthony, how are you doing today? I'm doing real good, and I'm excited to dive into this three-headed monster because last season we saw Patrick Graham utilize a pretty much elite duo at safety. Then towards the end of the year, once McKinney was healthy, you know, those final two games, we saw him on the field a lot more. We got a little glimpse of what that three-headed monster might look like, and McKinney played really well in the season finale against the Dallas Cowboys, um, and those three really just played well together. So I think it's going to be exciting to see, you know, now with a full season of Xavier McKinney, if he could stay healthy and the rest of them could stay healthy, what will that trio look like? Will we see a lot of dime? Will we see a lot of nickel with three safeties out there? Like, will Xavier McKinney still move into the slot like he was doing when he was on the field in 2020? It's going to be interesting to see how they're utilized. I think I have an idea of how they're going to be utilized. And I do think that it's going to be really huge for the Giants to have those three really good safeties out there. Because when you can cover that back end and you have safeties that can move up into the box and move into the slot and just move all over the place, it's really like playing chess. You have a lot of chess pieces out there. You have a lot of guys that can do a lot of different things and it impact the game in multiple different ways. Running game, passing game, um, and even as pass rushers, these guys could do a little bit there. So I think it's going to be really excited to see how exactly Patrick Graham utilizes utilizes them, but I do know this, that those three are going to play really, really well together, and it's going to be an elite trio of safeties that most teams do not possess. That's exactly right, and I want to start with Logan Ryan, because he's the guy that I feel has not only an impact on the field, but off the field, too. He was a major player in helping bring Adore Jackson to the secondary, which is a big deal, you know, locking down that CB2 position with a press man coverage corner, an aggressive corner. Um, who can hold up on off-ball cut press and also can play at the line of scrimmage and bump and run. I really love what Adore Jackson brings to this team as a healthy player. In the past, the injuries have taken their toll. They have been significant at times. He had a knee injury last year. He only played in about two games, and he got torched when he was available. But in the past, you know, he's been a very quality player, and I think if he does live up to that potential, the Giants are going to have two CB1s playing um, in the secondary there with James Bradbury and Jackson. So that's the benefit of having him. And Logan Ryan, not only playing a recruiter role, but also just a quality player in the defensive backfield. And, you know, looking at his snaps across the board, he played 1,078 total snaps last year. In the box, 246 total snaps. At slot corner, 221. At uh, free safety, 512. So he was really utilized across the board at a variety of different positions. His alignments varied um, and that helped Patrick Graham disguise those coverages, disguise uh, that 3-4 defense they loved to run last year with the outside linebackers and spies. And Logan Ryan, you know, we asked uh, Brian Walker, you know, our, our close friend and, and trainer of Jabril Peppers and Xavier McKinney and Darnay Holmes, we asked him, you know, why does Logan Ryan uh, play vertical to the sideline? He always has his body, his chest facing the sideline. He's, it's, not, it's not always facing the quarterback in the field. And he said it's, it's really just the mobility to create confusion for the quarterback. They don't know if he's going back. They don't know if he's going forward. Um, and it really helps him... Uh, diagnose what the you know what the play is happening after after the snap post snap, but also confuse the quarterback and really try to hide some of their zone coverages they were playing last year, um, and what they were trying to do in the defensive backfield with with those three headed safeties or really the two headed before Xavier McKinney 
uh, made that comeback. But Logan Ryan played a tremendous role in this defense. Um, nobody really expected him to be that good. He's a little bit older now. Uh, he's in his 30s, and you know they just signed him to another three-year deal. He's a pretty short tackler. He's good in the slot. He's aggressive. But the main portion is he's that leader on defense, right? I know they have Blake Martinez as their Mike linebacker, but they also have a leader in the secondary helping diagnose plays, um, you know, cover up those weak spots, cutting off uh, balls and stuff like that. So I think that the the value he brings to this team is very, very diverse. It's, he's extremely versatile. He only allowed 364 yards in coverage last year um, and 37 receptions on 50 targets. So overall, he had a fantastic season for us. He, the, justify, the justification for extending him is quite obvious. Uh, without him, those youngsters, it's a lot harder for them to develop to the, to the modern game, especially guys like McKinney. Um, Isaac Yadam, Julian Love, you know, these guys are learning from Logan Ryan. He's down in Tampa right now. I don't I don't anticipate a lot of those DBs actually attending voluntary workouts because they're down in Tampa right now working with, with Logan Ryan and his trainer. He's really taken the role of not only on the field being a leader, but off the field too. He's gathering his teammates, you know. He's gathering them in Tampa Bay and Florida and really having them work out with him and his and his his program and everything so they have more chemistry going into the season. I think that's a massive benefit for this team, massive benefit for this uh for this uh, secondary, and I think Patrick Graham and Joe Judge have given him the autonomy to really go out and make those decisions as a leader and be like, we're not going to be attending voluntary camp, but we're getting the work in. I'll make sure of that. That says a lot to me about his role on this team and how they view him as not only a player, but also a coach um, who's on that field. So uh, Logan Ryan, just unbelievable player. I think you know he's one of the most underrated guys on the Giants for a variety of reasons, but also one of the most valued player on this team. So Anthony, when you're looking at Logan Ryan, what does he mean to you as one of those one of the heads of that three headed monster in the backfield? Um, and you know what is his influence this upcoming season? Yeah, Logan Ryan is absolutely a captain, like a safety or a, a leader on the defense, right? But so is Jabril Peppers, who actually is the captain, has the captain's patch. So you've got two leaders in your secondary, but I think what separates Logan Ryan from Jabril Peppers in terms of their leadership, I think Jabril Peppers is more of your locker room, get the guys hyped, be a leader, get them all focused for game day. Logan Ryan's that guy who's behind the scenes making sure that you're getting the details right, making sure that you're training, keeping your body rate right, and bringing those veteran wisdoms to the locker room, you know, because he has been in the league for a while, and he's been part of some winning cultures. Um, he was part of the New England Patriots for a long time, and then, of course, he was with the Tennessee Titans when they made it pretty deep in the playoffs as well and knocked out the Patriots. So I think that when you look at that, you say this is a guy who knows exactly what Joe Judge wants to install in the locker room, what kind of culture he's looking for. And I think that's why Logan Ryan ultimately was such a good fit with the Giants, because he already knew day one what his role was off the field. He knew what he needed to do to get these youngsters ready and get them prepared and get them installed with this culture, this specific culture that Joe Judge was trying to create, because this, this culture that Joe Judge is trying to create does have a lot of similarities to New England. I think it's a little bit more liberated than New England. I feel like those guys are kind of like not allowed to have fun and have to like be really, really serious at all times. I think the Giants have a little bit more fun to them, but it's still the same principle of making sure you get your job done and you play hard football and you take it serious at all times. And I think that's what the beauty of Joe Judge's culture has been, is that it is serious and that it does come from Bill Belichick, but it's not as serious as it as Bill Belichick makes it. And there is some freedom to have fun. So I, I really love that about Joe Judge, and I think that that's something that Logan Ryan completely understands, because this is a young team. These guys are hard to just control. Like, you, you need to let them have some fun. But, of course, you need to discipline these guys and make sure that they take things seriously and make sure that they condition, something that the other two coaches weren't doing, apparently, according to Sterling Shepard. The Giants are doing conditioning drills. Apparently, Pat Shermer and Ben McAdoo didn't have the Giants do conditioning drills. I think that's completely ridiculous and almost insane, but... Besides the point, with Logan Ryan, the way that he has helped install this culture and it helped install the principles that Joe Judge wants to is really important. And then, of course, I think his fit on the defense, he's the best free safety that the Giants have. He's the best roaming guy down on the back end. I think Jabril Peppers works best in the box, and I think Xavier McKinney works also best in the box, but also best in the slot position, moving him around in multiple different places. But Logan Ryan, if you want a guy to just go down to free safety, disguise his coverages, read one half of the field, and just lock that down and keep a quarterback from throwing that way, that's Logan Ryan. He's really good in those deep safety zones, and I think that's really where he fits best along with those um, other guys in Xavier McKinney and Jabril Peppers. So, Logan Ryan, you can't say enough about how much of a leader he's been, but also he has been excellent as a coverage safety, and the Giants really, really needed that going into last season. 
Exactly. And, and Logan Ryan, he's so smart in the defensive backfield. He was really his first year transitioning to free safety. And he did such a tremendous job. He was probably ranked among some of the best free safeties in the NFL last year. And that kind of plays into our next player, Xavier McKinney, because, you know, we've said maybe Xavier McKinney is going to be playing more of a free safety role, but I don't think that's actually the case. And, and you don't either. And after looking at Logan Ryan and those snap counts, it makes more sense. You know, they could be playing two deep safeties and cover two a lot, just cover two man. Uh, but I think they want to play more cover one. That's kind of where Patrick Graham's uh, strengths lie in. They want to play more cover one. They want one deep safety. They want to man up across the board. And they want to send extra blitzers. That's exactly how the Giants defense will probably look in 2021 with more pass rushers. You know, and we talked about the pass rushers the other day. They added a Fetty Odenabo. They added Aziz Ojolari. They added Ryan Anderson. And those are three quality players who can make an impact compared to what we had last season. So that will really help the defensive secondary as well. But Xavier McKinney is a player who, you know, he's a thumper. He can come and he can stop the run. He can play strong safety. He can play free safety. He can go up into the box. He can play in the slot. Um, he can do a lot of different things. So I think the Giants are going to use these safeties primarily to disguise these coverages and really put themselves in a position where the defense can make plays. Um, and the quarterback's going to have a very, very difficult time diagnosing exactly what's going on in the field. They might see... Xavier McKinney playing in the slot. They might see Jabril Peppers playing at free safety, but the second that ball goes to post snap, Jabril Peppers could, could rotate into strong safety. Logan Ryan could rotate back into free safety. Xavier McKinney could rotate into like more of a more of a money backer role. You know, we don't really know how they're gonna do this, but I guarantee you we're gonna see all these guys just like shifting like like a Rubik's Cube. They're gonna be you're gonna be like, what the hell is going on? Um, unless you know how to solve a Rubik's Cube, then you're then you know. You're going to figure it out pretty quickly. But <laughs> but this safety trio, is that's the versatility and um, unexpectedness that they offer you is that they can rotate positions. Every, you, every single play, you could have all three of those guys literally just going strong safety, free safety, slot, strong safety, free safety, slot, go into the box, uh, blitz off the edge. You could have those guys just rotating every single freaking play, and the defense is going to be like, what are they doing? You know, who, the, who is actually doing? Who's blitzing right now? Who's dropping into coverage? Who's covering that, that uh, the seam? Who's covering our tight ends? Who's covering our running backs? Um, do we have a mismatch to, to capitalize on right now? That's the thing. There really isn't no, there isn't a mismatch they can do because all three of those guys are capable of covering tight ends and running backs. Logan Ryan, as we know, can cover slot receivers. He can cover out wide. Uh, Xavier McKinney can cover slot receivers, tight ends, running backs. Like they can all do a lot of it, um, which really excites me. But Anthony, you know, you did a you did a film breakdown before uh, McKinney even joined the Giants. When you're looking at McKinney as a player and his growth, he had a really great final performance against Dallas. He had, uh, I think, he had seven total tackles. He had a tackle for a loss, interception. He almost had another interception um, in that one game. He, he really dominated that contest, and that was the first time I saw McKinney and said, "Okay, like I know what we have in him now." McKinney was supposed to be a first round pick, dropped to the second round. Of course, the Giants walked away with a player uh, that was considered the best safety in the draft. Very versatile a physical player out of Alabama. Those those defensive guys out of Alabama, not only are they extremely physical, but they're coming from an NFL-style scheme already. They know how to play an NFL-style defense. It translates very efficiently, um, and the Giants know that. So that's why they get a lot of Alabama guys. And I think McKinney, this upcoming year, with a full season of training camp, with a full season of live action and training um, and preseason, is going to be phenomenal. Like He's already training down there. He looks bigger. If you've seen him, he looks like he's put on some muscle mass, too, and some size, which, I, which is what I wanted from him because he was a little bit thin. Um, you know, he was he missed a couple of tackles here and there. I think that exercise is going to do him well, um, adding some speed, adding some strength and lean muscle mass. And I'm really ex excited to see what he can offer this team this upcoming year, a little bit of maturity too um, and experience. So, Anthony, when you're looking at Xavier McKinney, how do you think they play with him, play him in unison with these other players um, and the value that he's going to bring this team? Yeah, it's funny because you talk about Swiss Army Knives, right, on a, on a NFL defense, and I feel like the Giants kind of have two of them. I think Xavier McKinney is very much a Swiss Army Knife along with Jerome Peppers. Um, one thing that I want to, you know, really hit on here is his snap count from week 17. That was the first time that we saw him play starting level snaps. He played 82 snaps in week 17. 47 of them came at slot corner. 20 of them were at free safety. So the Giants were very much trying to utilize him um, in coverage is what that tells me with slot cornerback and I think that that could be kind of a glimpse kind of a peek into what we could see from the Giants next season that you do see Xavier McKinney play a fair amount of free safety but I think you also see him play a lot of slot corner and just move around because when I watched the film you know when he was at Alabama I've told the story a few times I'm gonna tell it again 
I was watching the film against Texas A&M. He's playing strong safety because that's what he played in college. He was mainly in the box as a safety. He's playing strong safety, but the slot cornerback for Alabama is just getting beat down by Texas A&M slot receiver. Like, I don't know why, but this guy was just dominating. So they're like, okay, we need to stop this guy. We need to slow him down. What are we going to do? They rotated Xavier McKinney into the slot. He plays slot cornerback. I don't know if that slot receiver had another catch that game. Xavier McKinney had like three pass breakups while defending that guy. It was insane. He just completely locked him down, shut him down, and basically saved single-handedly Alabama's defense. So Xavier McKinney really is a good slot cornerback when he needs to be. Of course, he's a good safety. Week 16 of this year, he played 37 free safety snaps and only two slot cornerback snaps. And he did play 79 total snaps that week. So I think that's interesting. um, Or 48 total snaps that week, sorry. But I think that's interesting how they're moving him around. They're playing him at safety and they're playing him in the slot because when I watch the film, I noticed he's really good at safety, but he's also really good at playing the slot. He's got really great man coverage skills. Personally, I think we need to see him in a box a little bit more. He only had 26 total snaps a season in the box, only had a high of six snaps in a single week in the box. Because he's really good at getting down there and playing press man on tight ends. So I want to see him do that a little more. But I do think that might have something to do with the fact that he was a little bit thin in his rookie season. Alex just mentioned he put on some size, put on some muscle. I think that's going to go a long way for him in terms of getting down in the box and guarding those tight ends. Um, McKinney really wasn't a rangy free safety in college. Everyone thinks that he was this guy who just, you put him in a single high and he's just going to range around and cover the entire uh, deep part of the field. That's not what he did in college. What he did best was got in the box and made plays in the running game and then played man coverage on tight ends and slot receivers. I think they're going to utilize him in that way. And I think that was demonstrated by him playing 47 snaps at slot cornerback in week 17. Um, And that's when he played his by far best game. That was his best performance. And that was the first time we saw him play starting level snaps. So with Xavier McKinney and really the Giants three safeties in general, this is what I, I would like to see. Let's say it's a base Tampa 2 and a nickel or dime defense, okay? What I want is free safety, left side. I think Logan Ryan should be playing that half of the field. I think the other half of the field, the right side, that should be Xavier McKinney. If you're having two deep safeties, you should have Xavier McKinney on the strong side playing strong safety, and then the free safety should be Logan Ryan because Logan Ryan has more range to get from one side to the other, and I think Xavier McKinney, you want him on the strong side in case they're running. He can get down in the box pretty quickly and make a play. Then in the box, playing linebacker, that's where you want Jibro Peppers. You want him playing that you know middle half, that guy that stands right in the middle of those two zones in the, in the Tampa 2, or even playing one of the hook zones on either side of the field likely on the strong side so he can get on the tight end's face. So that's ultimately what I see being the best way to utilize those safeties. You have free safety, you keep Logan Ryan there, and you have him play there all game, unless you need him to get into the slot for some reason. I think you just have him play free safety all game. With strong safety, I want Xavier McKinney on the strong side just because he's so stout and run the fence. And then, of course, Jabril Peppers, he really is a linebacker in a safety's body. Like, he hits like a linebacker, he covers as well as a safety, and he really makes his the amount of run plays that you would expect a linebacker to play. So um, I think that him in the box and then those two safeties up top, that's really, really hard for defenses or offenses to beat and to scheme around because that's a lot of different guys who can do a lot of different things in a lot of different places. So in terms of versatility, that's exactly what you're looking for. And that three-headed monster right there, to me, that's the best way to utilize them. And I do think that's the way that the Giants ultimately will utilize them in 2021. Yeah, I, I think I think that's spot on. You know, when you're looking at your Bill Peppers, um, as, as we'll move on to him right now, the final head of this three-headed safety tr- uh, trio, another guy, if you look at his snap count, 383 in the box, 264 at slot, 143 at free safety, uh, 44 at wide corner, the guy was all over the place. You know, again, another safety in this trio playing all over the place. This is not a, a pure fire strong safety. You know, he is moving around the field. They're getting creative. They're... They're trying to confuse defenses. It's phenomenal to watch because the fact that Patrick Graham was able to establish a defense as intricate and detailed as this with no time to really put it to the test in preseason, barely any in-person training, <laughs> it's it's actually, like, magical. You know what I mean? Like, wh- how did how did he even pull this off is, is what I was trying to figure out. And and the fact that, you know, the guy's a badass. You know, he motivates his players. We've We've heard the clips. And the one thing that really stood out to me is in the in the press conferences with Patrick Graham, he was like, oh, we're just playing base concepts. You know, we're just playing base. We're not doing much. We're not really doing anything different. And then you look at it on the field and you're like, 
These guys are making, are moving, they're rotating, they're disguising the three, four coverages. <coughs> We're talking about a unit that had 40 sacks with Carter Coughlin and Jabal shared as the starting outside linebackers for a majority of the season, guys. This is not a regular defense. This is a, a well-coached, a well-disciplined um, of a unit that's being held accountable. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what they can do this upcoming season because Jabril Peppers, <coughs> excuse me, um, he has such an influential part to play in this entire unit because, you know, he's in his contract year. This is his final year. They picked up his fifth-year option. I expect him to take a step forward. I actually ranked him as a breakout player. That's how much left I think he has in the tank. I think he, uh, he played at a Pro Bowl level last season, but I think he actually has so much left in the tank that we haven't seen yet because the lack of in-person training, because it was a new scheme, because he didn't have chemistry with all of his new teammates. You add all these other elements to the, to, the, to the piece, to the puzzle, and you're talking about a player who now has support at CB2, has support with Xavier McKinney behind him, has more of a pass rush. He can get more creative, use that physicality, blitz off the edge, have man, man coverage against tight ends where he can, he can actually play uh, good coverage. Jabril Peppers is going to be a fantastic player for us as long as he stays healthy. You know, and I, I would hate, 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 hate to let him go. Um, and if you're listening to this on YouTube, let me know. Um, or even if you're on Apple or Spotify, head over to YouTube and let us know in the comment section. Do you think the Giants should resign Jabril Peppers? And for what kind of contract do you think makes the most sense? Do you think a three-year deal, maybe uh, $30 million, I think he'll want more. Three years, $40 million maybe with $25 million guaranteed. That might make sense to me. Um, you know, he's making like $13 million per season, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, but again, he's a very good player. You're, you're going to need him because Logan Ryan, eventually, they will have to move on from him due to age, due to monetary cap situation, whatever. Um, he's, he has three years left on his deal. He just on a brand new contract, but it's essentially a two-year deal, and the dead money goes down in the third year. So they still have Logan Ryan for another two seasons. But Jabril Peppers, man, he's the energizer bunny, man. He's that guy who really goes out and energizes this defense. He he lifts his guys around him. He rallies to the ball. He lays he lays hits on guys. Like he he wakes people up at night. You know what I mean? So I'll tell you this: I would love to keep Jabril Peppers. His development has been just phenomenal to watch. Um, transitioning from from uh, free safety to strong safety with the Giants, and also getting diverse and versatile with his style of play. I'm super excited to see what Jabril Peppers can do in the future. Um, what he has to offer because I think that he is an integral piece to this puzzle and letting him go would be devastating for this defense. I, I really I really do feel that way. So let us know in the comment section what you think about Jabril Peppers, um, if you think they should extend him and what kind of deal would make the most sense to you. Uh, but Anthony, you know, when you're looking at Jabril, uh, how does how does he play into this defense for the most part? I know you hit on that a little bit in your in your last uh, little narrative there, but you know, when it looks like when you're looking at Jabril, do you want him more stopping the run? Are you okay with him transitioning to free safety and really just like playing all over the place in this kind of a uh, diverse role? And, and, you know, how do you see him making a, the most impact in 2021? I see him making the most impact in the box, strong safety, inside linebacker. You know, in those nickel formations, he's playing the money backer role. Um, when you look at his career alignment and you really look at his career in general, when he was with the Cleveland Browns, it was very confusing. They decided to make him their single high rangey free safety, which didn't make any sense if you watched him in college. And I'm sure a lot of, pe a lot of people viewing this have watched him in college because he is considered like one of the most dominant college players of all time, or what, at least one of the most electric and exciting. Um, Jabril Peppers was like a true marvel when he played for Michigan. So um, for him to just move to box or to free safety in his rookie season with the Cleveland Browns was bewildering. But as soon as he got traded to the Giants, they transitioned him. They said, okay, you're going to be playing primarily in the box now. That's where we're moving you. And the, the past two years, he's played the overwhelming majority of his snaps in the box, which is really good. Um, means he's now in that strong safety role and now being utilized the way that he's supposed to be. Manning up on tight ends, defending the run, setting the edge. Those are the things that he's good at. And ultimately, yeah, that's what he's going to be doing. What he's going to continue to do, what he's been doing. He's going to continue to impact the running game and guard tight ends because that's what he's best at. One thing that I think is really interesting, he had a career high in pass breakups this year. And if you look at his coverage year to year, this was probably his best year in coverage yet. Um, or at least he's definitely showing improvement. So he had the most pass breakups this year. He only allowed 10.8 yards per reception. Um, and he only allowed two touchdowns and had one interception with those seven pass breakups. So those are really good numbers there. And the completion percentage was only 68.7%, which is pretty good. Um, he was targeted a lot more in coverage this year. The Giants used him in a coverage role far more frequently. Um, he had 67 targets, but he only let up 46 receptions. And I think that's pretty solid stuff right there. So he's continuing to develop in coverage. And I think he's already so good in the running game. 
um, as a run defender in the box. So when Alex mentions him as a breakout candidate, I think, you know, Jabril's really already had his breakout, but I could I do see a higher ceiling than what he's put out there, you know? Yeah, he played at a Pro Bowl level. Didn't make the Pro Bowl, but did play at a Pro Bowl level this past season. But realistically, Jabril Peppers could reach an all-pro level at some point. Like, he's got the tools to do that. He's got the skills. He's good enough in coverage, and he's great in the running game, and he is a, a true leader, and he's also just an exciting, fun player to watch. Um, so the ceiling is definitely still high for him, and he still has room to improve. Um, because he still is a young player. But in terms of what the Giants should do, if it were me, I would extend him as soon as possible because I do think that he's going to have a really, really good season this year. You know, you look at safety play. Safety play is so, like, predicated on what, what the talent around them is. Like, it's so dependent on that, right? Like, if you remember when Landon Collins was playing for the Giants and he had Curtis Riley opposite of him, he had a horrible season because he had to overcompensate for all of the mistakes that Curtis Riley and the other um, delinquents in the secondary were making. So that really affected Landon Collins, and that could affect Jabril Peppers, but this secondary is so talented now. You know, last year, Jabril Peppers was better when the cornerbacks around him were better, when the safety next to him was better. This year, the cornerbacks are even better. The safeties are supposed to take another step forward. Jabril Peppers could actually take a huge leap forward because of the talent around him being so good. And then you could see him just really elevate his game. And once that happens, he's going to need to get paid significantly more. So if I were the Giants, I would extend him as soon as possible before he plays up into this higher level of pay grade and becomes a, one of the established as one of the best safeties in the NFL. So I would extend him as soon as possible. I want Jabril Peppers here for as long as possible. I do think that he is the heart and soul of this defense right now in terms of the energy and leadership that he brings and in terms of the versatility that he brings to the table, something that Joe Judge has preached that he wants really badly is versatility. So if there's anyone to teach any of the youngsters about versatility, I would say Jabril Peppers. He's one of the most versatile players on this team, one of the best leaders, and really just one of the best players on the Giants in general. So Giants, I think, should extend him as soon as possible, get it out of the way so that they're not overpaying in any way or paying just an exuberant amount for a strong safety. So extend him ASAP, and I, I want to see him here for a very long time because Jabril Peppers is one of the most exciting players on the Giants and, like I said, one of the best. Hey, yeah, pay the pay the man. Give him his bag. Pull up the Brinks truck for him. I don't care. The guy deserves it. I think he's he's showed us the energy and the uplifting uh, mentality he brings to this team. So I'm excited to see what Jabal Peppers can do in his his fifth year contract option and really and really ball out for this team. Um, and put it put it all on the field, man. Like leave it on the field. If, if they're gonna pay him, it's gonna be it's gonna be because he lays it all on the field and, and shows this team why he's worth it. And I think he's worth it. I think he's more worth it than Landon Collins was. Obviously, we didn't go with him, and he's been awful for the for Washington since then. And you know, it was mainly because the guy couldn't cover. You know, the, Landon Collins just like literally could not cover anybody. Jabal Peppers has worked his ass off to develop that portion of his game, and he's become a quality player. I think that, honestly, that time at free safety in Cleveland has helped him tremendously as a coverage player. Um, and it really translated over to strong safety and helped him diagnose those route concepts in the middle of the field and help him uh, more in that category. So I'm hoping they extend him. I would love more, nothing more than that, guys. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Obviously, now we're going to transition to the fan voicemail portion of this video. So enjoy that. Um, we, had, we had four voicemails that we're going to go through. And make sure to leave one yourself because we're going to answer all of them every Monday. We're going to gather all the voicemails and we're going to answer as many as we can and try to get some really good content out for you guys and make this more of a community for you because we know uh, you know, how much you guys watch the Fireside Giants channel. We want to give back and make sure that you guys are included as well because that's the whole thing. That's the whole point of this is to make this a community around you and have some fun. Um, so make sure to leave a voicemail. The number is on the screen on the background on YouTube if you're listening on Apple and Spotify. You can drop us a voicemail um, and I'll even read out the voicemail for you. If you're listening on Apple and Spotify, you don't want to head over there. It's pretty simple. It's 929 one second here. Let me get the rest of it. It is 929-359-3702. So if on Apple or Spotify and you don't want to go over to YouTube and you want to leave a voicemail for us, 929-359-3702. And we're going to uh, put your stuff on the channel so you can check it out. And uh, we'll answer your questions live as always. So we really appreciate you guys and enjoy the second portion of the video. To the second portion of this video where we're doing fan mailbag questions through voicemail. Obviously, we have implemented this new voicemail feature where you can call the numbers on the screen on YouTube, and we're going to be answering these, and if you're lucky, I'll send you some stickers. I have some coming in the mail, so once I get those, you can hit me up at, at Alex Wilson ESM on Twitter, and I'll send you some cool stickers uh, for Fireside Giants, and you know, give, some, give back to the community. You know how it is. So let's jump into our first uh, voicemail. Hey, Alex, Anthony. 
This is Joshin calling from Atlanta. Uh, my question is, do you feel like Kyle Rudolph will be ready for open season? And Saquon Barkley. I feel like Saquon will be ready. Uh, I'm hoping Kyle Rudolph will be ready too. But, uh, yeah, those, that's my, really my question. Do you feel like Kyle Rudolph and Saquon will be ready for week one? So thank you for calling Josh, our first voicemail and of uh, this new series, and I'm excited to answer your question. For Kyle Rudolph, he did say, you know, this is this was a really interesting injury because for the most part, it kind of happened strangely. They signed a contract with him for two years, and then out of nowhere, this list Frank injury on his foot came up, and they were like, oh crap, like maybe we shouldn't sign him to to a contract, and then they ended up pushing through and making and, and making the deal. And I think um, the premise is that he's going to be healthy for the start of the season. Kyle Rudolph said it himself. He anticipates he's going to he's, he's at the facilities. He's training. He's rehabilitating with the coaching staff um, and the training staff. And he says he's going to be ready for the start of the regular season. So I'm I'm optimistic that he'll be ready. Um, and I feel as though he's going to be playing a big factor on this on this offense, really, um, because we know Evan Ingram had his fair share of weaknesses last year, especially with the dropped passes, and those really came in the middle of the field from 0 to 10 yards out, which is where Kyle Rudolph will essentially be operating the most. He's like a knockoff Jason Wynn. He's, he's J- the Jason Wynn for Jason Garrett's offense, and I think that's kind of how they plan to use him as a security blanket in the middle of the field, and him being healthy is imperative. Obviously, the foot injury is of concern, you know, since they, it did pop up, but since the Giants felt as though he's going to be ready, they kept the, the deal the same. I don't even think they knocked any money off the deal they just retained it um and it looks like he'll be ready to go for the start of the regular season as for Saquon Barkley um everyone believes he's going to be ready you know they probably will ease him into shape I think he'll be ready for week one but they're probably going to ease him in make sure he's 100% ready to go that's why they got Devontae Booker who was a three down back to supplement him if he needs any time to get used to it you know get ready on that knee um you know he tore it up pretty badly so it's going to take a little bit of time maybe not physically but definitely mentally for him to trust that knee again in live action so I think the first two three weeks will be imperative for him to, to gaining that confidence back Anthony but what are you thinking about those two players and their comeback yeah, I'm actually not worried like at all about Kyle Rudolph's foot injury. Um, they said that he had the injury. They thought it would heal on its own. It didn't, so he needed some surgery to clean it up. And they got that surgery done really, really quickly within 24 hours of agreeing to a deal, apparently. They like had the surgery all scheduled and ready to go. And he said himself, I'm not missing any football. Like I'll be at OTAs, which he was, according to a report, he was at OTAs. He'll be at OTAs. He'll participate in training camp, and he'll absolutely be ready for week one of the season. If that's what he said, if that's what the Giants medical staff told him, Who am I to disagree? I believe him. I think that he'll be ready, and I don't think he's going to miss any time. And I do think that his impact on the Giants' offense is going to be pretty huge this season, um, just in terms of being a phenomenal red zone threat. 40 of his 48 career touchdowns have come in the red zone, and being one of the most sure-handed tight ends in the NFL. Like, he just doesn't drop passes, hasn't dropped one in two years, and he's really, really good at sitting down in the middle of the field in the intermediate range and making just easy catches on little hook routes and stuff, which is what Evan Engram really struggled with. And and that's what Kyle Rudolph excels in. So, yeah, I do think he plays that Jason Witten role in Jason Garrett's offense. And I think he has a huge impact on um, the Giants offense just because I think, you know, Daniel Jones needed someone he can count on. He needed a tight end with dependability. Maybe not just a vertical threat matchup nightmare like Evan Engram is. He needs a more traditional tight end that can block and make short catches in traffic. Now we've got that guy who can make short catches in traffic. And it's Kyle Rudolph, and I think he's going to be healthy, ready to go, like he said. And I'm excited to see it. I think it's going to be good. I think he's going to be a really, really good player for the Giants offense this year. I'm excited to see him uh, get to work with us. And then, of course, Saquon Barkley. So with Barkley, obviously that was a significant injury. And part of the reason that he suffered that injury was his playing style, right? That refusal to go down, that, you know, always looking to break an extra tackle. He's going to have to change the way that he plays at least a little bit with this, you know, coming back from this injury. Because when you watch the play that he got injured on, he's running to the sideline. Eddie Jackson's tackling him. And instead of running through Eddie Jackson and just going out of bounds, he tries to plant his foot in the ground, put a lot of weight on his knee, and move back with a stiff arm. That's a lot of strain to put on your knee. Um, And those are the type of moves that you do as a runner that can injure your knee. And it did. It just came back to bite him. But those are the moves that we're so accustomed 
custom machine Saquon Barkley make, where custom machine him cut on a dime, hurdle left, hurdle right, hurdle forward, jump backwards, and then make six people miss. That's Saquon Barkley. He's just a tackle-breaking machine. But on that particular play, it came back to bite him because he just put a lot of strain on his knee with that one move that he was trying to do. So I do think he has to alter the way that he plays a little bit, be a little safer, be a little smarter with his body and the way that he cuts on his knees and ankles and all that stuff. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to hamper him too much. Saquon Barkley is a phenomenal player, phenomenal talent, and a phenomenal specimen as a human being. Like, that dude is just built different, absolutely built different. Look at his legs. I've never seen anything like them. So I think, you know, they said he's on on track to be healthy for the season. I'll believe the Giants medical staff. I don't think they're out here to lie. If he says he's going to be ready, I actually think I heard that he was ahead of schedule too. So um, Saquon Barkley, I think he's going to be healthy for the start of the season. I don't think the injury is going to hamper him too much, but I just think he's going to have to be a little bit smarter with the contact that he goes into and probably try to protect his body a little bit more. I have a ton of respect for the way that he was playing, just putting his body on the line every single play to try and get that first down, try to get that extra yardage. But running backs, that's always the problem, right? They're an injury-prone position because of that, because they're always looking for that extra yardage and always trying to do too much. It's going to be time for Saquon to realize my body can't keep up with this even though I'm built completely different. I'm going to have to reel it back or just scale it back just a little bit, continue to be the tackle-breaking machine that I am, but in certain situations, protect my body because he wasn't protecting his body, right? So he's going to have to do that just a little bit more. So I do think Saquon Barkley has a huge season, especially because we added all those playmakers on the outside in the receiving game. I think that opens things up in the box for him to have a really nice field day behind a hopefully improved offensive line. So I do think Saquon Barkley bounces back and is, you know, maybe even a comeback player of the year candidate. Um, I really do think that could be in his future. So I'm not really too worried about these two injuries. I think that these guys, you know, they're ahead of schedule. They're both supposed to be ready to go, and I think that they will be, and they're two phenomenal talents. So I'm excited to see what they do for us. That's exactly right. So, Josh, thank you so much for calling in from Atlanta to give us some uh, some of your questions, and hopefully we answered that in enough detail. And thank you so much for tuning into Fireside Giants, and, as always. And also, screw Atlanta. Let's go next. Uh, there you go. Well, I hope, uh, Josh, I hope you're a Knicks fan, too. I mean, you're a Giants fan, so you must be from New York or at least have some sort of connection to us. Um, but if you're an Atlanta fan, Trey Young definitely uh, pulled off a couple of uh, skeptical fouls at the end there. It was a uh, kind of BS, if you ask me. It's but a soft as league. A it's fan, a very soft league. It is. LeBron is setting the stage for a couple of these just ridiculous fouls. MJ would have never done nonsense like this. It's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> another another debate for another day. But let's dive into the next question. Um, hello, good mo- um, good morning, or well, it is early morning. I'm to speak. I like to speak on your blog that you have on YouTube about John's defense. Well, um, listen, it started rebuilding when they snatched Leonard Williams, but I always feel with John's defense they always had good defense, and then they had always do good defensive players. They just didn't know how to piece piece them together. I'm just surprised they got Leonard Williams, and they're building on that. Now they let um. Uh, you know, they let the nose tackle, though. He's playing, he's playing for, I think, another team, but they're still building on it. I think we have a good defense. Now, people have their – with Daniel Jones, listen, I when we, we took Eli Manning, it's the same thing. You know, I feel that we're going to get better because we have an offensive coordinator of Patrick of, – of, of Jason Garrett. So, I think that will be a major – that will be a major step, and he will just to that – and to uh, – to Mr. De- um, Daniel Jones – to, to get better, but to me, I feel like this, you know, if they really, you know, they got him with your fact for reasons, they feel like that, I think Eli, Eli teach him. I think Eli spoke highly of him, so if Eli speaks highly of him, then we should have faith in him. Thank you. Thank you so much for leaving that awesome voicemail, and there's a couple things I want to touch on regarding, uh, you know, this little narrative here, and I think, you know, you hit it on the head. The Giants have had good pieces on defense in the past. They just haven't been able to capitalize and maximize their potential. That is something that, you know, we finally have an answer with with our new coaching staff and Patrick Graham and Joe Judge and a lot of these behind-the-scenes guy and assistants um, and, like, Coach Chaos and whatnot. So I'm really excited to see what they can do with some really great talent and some great coaches to maximize it. And I think that's going to be a major step in this defense taking even another step forward after ranking top 10 in the league last year in points allowed per game. Of course, you have Adore Jackson, Aziz Ojolari, Ryan Anderson, uh, uh, Fadi Adenabo. Um, you know, you have a ton of great players now to work with. You know, Danny Shelton at defensive tackle. So I'm excited to see what they do. I'm excited to see how they coach these guys up, how the scheme develops. Um, and I think you're right. Like, you know, now we have an opportunity um, 
that we retain Leonard Williams, we have a decent pass rush, we have good secondary guys, and we have good coaching staff. It should come together very nicely, and I hope that they do pan out. But, you know, the other point that you did make with Eli Manning and Daniel Jones is also interesting. You know, Daniel Jones obviously has had his fair share of struggles. Eli Manning had his fair share of struggles when he entered the NFL. Um, Vastly different players, vastly different issues. But Eli was always more of a pure passer than Daniel Jones. Always was more accurate, always um, more of a risk taker, not as much of a game manager as Daniel can be at times when he's not running the football and moving out of the pocket. So I think that Eli... Um, You know, he has said very good things about Daniel in the past. I think that, you know, we should value that because, uh, of course, he's not going to say anything bad about him. But, you know, I do think Daniel Jones has a ton of potential. I think that Eli Manning, um, you know, was a good person for him to learn behind for a year and really develop some sort of, uh, you know, just a lesson. He he set an example for how to prepare for a game, um, what to do. Uh, before the game in terms of the process and the the work ethic that must be included in being a great NFL quarterback. So I think Eli Manning definitely set the stage for him. And as long as he's he's involved in even mentoring uh, Daniel Jones at Flip Cup from afar, I think it's totally reasonable. So Anthony, you know, what do you think about this defense in terms of um, the coaching staff and how they're really maximizing their potential? And you know, Daniel Jones and, and Eli Manning's relationship. And do you think that there's something there that you know Daniel Jones might have learned from Manning something that's going to help him for the future? Well, first I'll say, in Patrick Graham, we trust. I think he's done a phenomenal job revamping this defense, you know, really making the scheme tailor fit to the personnel. Um, The Giants had a lack of press man corners last year, so they played a lot of disguised zone coverages. Um, They had a lack of edge rushing talent, so they did a lot of creative blitzes and stunts and figured out a way to fabricate pressure through the interior of the defensive line, which was really impressive. Patrick Graham, hats off to him. He did a phenomenal job. Like The Giants' defense was talented last year, but let's not pretend that there wasn't some major holes on it, right? Like at cornerback two, at inside linebacker two, and really both edge rushing positions, there were so many injuries and holes there. Like Patrick Graham did a phenomenal job, but the Giants did go out there. They got a Dory Jackson. CB2 looks to be locked down. Um, They didn't really address inside linebacker two, but I think that's where Xavier McKinney and Jabril Peppers come into play. I think you see Peppers slide into ILB2 a lot more frequently and can he play that box safety role a little bit more um, strong safety there so you know they really did fill those holes and then they added Aziz Ojolari on the edge Afadi Odenabo on the edge Ellerson Smith Ryan Anderson they added some more edge talent they got some more depth there so they really went and filled all those holes they've got all the talent and I believe fully that they have the coaching staff to make that talent work because Patrick Graham was really, really impressive to me um, last season. You know, his play calls, some of them, you know, I think back to the home game versus Washington where Alex Smith, you know, he threw an interception that was totally fabricated because of a disguised coverage. I believe it was either Logan Ryan or James Bradbury who had the pick, but they were just set up to succeed because of the disguise coverage, and that happened multiple times this past season. You know, disguise coverages leading to interceptions or bad throws or disguise blitzes leading to sacks and pressures, and, you know, we saw plays where, like, Jabril Peppers would just rush off the edge, ran through Chris Carson, got a sack on Russell Wilson, you know, and no one saw him coming, Right. Chris Carson saw him coming last second, but it was already too late. Now you're getting bulldozed and you're lighting up a sack. So there's really creative stuff that Patrick Graham did. And I totally think that, you know, with this talent, with that coaching staff, how talented it is, I do think this Giants defense should be a top five unit in the NFL. And then in terms of Daniel Jones, I think you probably know I'm a big believer in Daniel Jones. I really like DJ. um, And I think Danny Dimes has a bright future in this league if he can put it together this year. I think this is a crucial year for him. Now, the main problem with Daniel Jones is I feel like he's paired with an offensive coordinator that doesn't necessarily get the most out of him. Um, I'm hoping that that changes this season due to the influx of talent that we now have on offense. You know, added Kenny Galladay, added Kyle Rudolph, Kadarius Toney. Um, I think that those players should do a lot for Daniel Jones, giving him an underneath weapon that can run after the catch with Kadarius Toney, giving him a vertical guy, but also a big possession receiver with Kenny Galladay, just someone who can go up there and get it. Like, they needed that badly. And then they still have Sterling Shepard, refined route runner underneath, so got a good vertical threat with Darius Slayton. Like, this offense has finally come together. It's got all the pieces now. It's just time to put it together and see if they can make it work. Um, that's going to be largely predicated on Daniel Jones's ability to read the field and make the throws. And then of course, Jason Garrett's ability to scheme people open and make 
make life easy for Daniel Jones, right? So in terms of the comparisons to Eli Manning, I absolutely see them. You know, Eli struggled probably the first three and a half seasons of his career, then really turned it on there in the second half of that season. And I think they won the Super Bowl in his fourth year, um, which earned him his contract extension and solidified him as a franchise quarterback in New York. But that's rare that that happens, that you win, you know, uh, a Super Bowl and establish yourself as a franchise quarterback. Usually you need to establish that first and then go chase the ring. So that's going to be tough for Daniel Jones to do. You know, with where the Giants roster was last year, you look at that, like obviously no position to compete for a Super Bowl then, but we're building. And I think within the next couple of years might be our window of opportunity. Maybe we will have a, a, a moment to strike and try and contend for a Super Bowl. And if Daniel Jones can just put it together with all the talent that he put around him, maybe he can have a similar start to his career like Eli Manning. Struggle a couple of years, put it together, establish himself as a franchise quarterback. Now, only difference is, and this is a positive for Daniel Jones, Eli Manning sucked his first season and was just as bad his second season. Like, he was really bad to start his career. Daniel Jones, while the stat sheet might not show it, I know 11 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, I mean, he was a much better quarterback in his second season than he was in his first year. Like, he was already pretty good in his first year. He brought a new element to the Giants offense with his athleticism and his willingness to take shots downfield. Then season two, he's still willing to take shots downfield, but they're just not calling any plays for him to take shots downfield. He's making the most of the opportunities when he gets a chance, but he's still bringing that athleticism. I saw a lot of improvement from Daniel Jones in year two, and that's what gives me the confidence going into year three with all the extra talent around him. I think that he can take another big step and really establish himself this year. We don't have to wait till year four. We don't have to wait for him to get into the playoffs to really establish himself. I think that he can do it in year three, considering the talent, considering the improvements he made last year. If he can just keep building. Yeah, I think Danny Dimes establishes himself as a Giants franchise quarterback, and I do think we have a bright future with him, um, you know, leading this team for the next several years. Yeah, I agree with you. So I'm pretty excited to see what this defense can do moving forward, and obviously Daniel Jones. But let's move on to the next voicemail. Appreciate dropping in, my friend. I didn't leave a name, um, but you know what? We we love all you guys, and we love that you guys have, uh, you know, put this put this voicemail thing to the test, and, and we love answering for you. So let's move on to the next one. This one is from Victor, and I'm excited to dive into what you have to say, Victor. Hey, Alex. How you doing, man? And Anthony. Hey, my name is Victor. I live down here in Maryland. I always watch y'all cop, uh, cop ass, uh, podcast, and I and I listen to what y'all are saying. Y'all, you know, y'all sound like y'all know what y'all are talking about. I like I like listening to you. I'm a subscriber. I, I listen to y'all. But one thing y'all never talk about. Y'all talk about the running backs, wide receivers, offensive lines, defense in this net, safeties, and all that. Who we brought in, you know. Um, but y'all never talk about the kickoff and kick receive team. Because they're important too. Who's the dog on kick receipt? Who's the dog that goes down and he taps? Who's that man this year to return punts? Who's that man to return kickoffs? And who do y'all think? So I, I would like if y'all went to depth about every person who started last year, every person that went down field and gave a take on them, what college they from, who they were from, you know, what school they went and that now, how many tackles they have. How good are they? That would be a good podcast. The same. Victor. From Victor Smith. Uh, you can reach me on, uh, I'm on Bleacher Report as Touchdown Barkley. Hit me on there. That's the only other one I really have. I got off of Facebook, Instagram, all that. But it's always been Touchdown Barkley. I'm on Bleacher Report. I would like to see y'all drop something to me or follow me or follow y'all on Bleacher Report. Thanks. So, Victor, my man, thank you so much for leaving a voicemail. Great question here regarding the kick return and, you know, who is really, you know, taking these kickoffs for us and, and can we can we trust them? Obviously, last year, it was a blend of a variety of different players. The punts ranged from Drew Peppers, even Darius Slayton caught a few, and then the kickoffs were mostly Deion Lewis. And Deion Lewis obviously had a couple fumbles there, so that was a disaster. I'm really hoping, you know, they move on to someone who can catch and hold on to the football. And Deion Lewis is obviously not on this team anymore, so... That's an interesting, you know, position that <laughs> really is up for grabs. Who really knows who's going to go? Maybe Devontae Booker. Maybe Gary Brightwell's a guy who could return kicks if he makes the active 53. I think that might be a good one. You know, as a as a running back, he has some decent straight line speed, some good cuts and good moves and some power behind him. So Gary Brightwell out of Arizona. He's our sixth round pick out of Arizona. Rookie. Um, I would love to see him get an opportunity to return some kicks if he's active on game day. Um, you know, they might not activate him because he's, a, he's the third string running back, but you never know. 
Uh, we'll see how they operate there. I think Jarrell Peppers as the punt returner would be nice. Kadarius Tony even would be fine. John Ross. I know he has some issues catching the football occasionally, but I would like to see you know John Ross out of Washington, obviously. Um, Jarrell Peppers out of Michigan. Um, and Kadarius Tony out of Florida. Those are the three guys I would like to see get opportunities because a special teams punt return, kick return can be the, ch- the difference in a game at any moment. You know, they can be the difference. It can change the course. It can change the momentum. And we know how much um, uh, Joe Judge loves to harp on the special teams unit. So if you can maximize those guys and that potential there and actually score and get some good field position, it changes everything. So I'm really hoping that the Giants can um, figure that out and get some good players involved in the, in the return game, Anthony. So, you know, what are you thinking in terms of uh, that specifically? Yeah, I'm thinking Kadarius Tony should be the punt returner this year. Um, you know, you might see Jabril Peppers field some, but I think Kadarius Tony just his tackle breaking ability, his ball carrier vision, the way that he reads the field in open space, you know, finds lanes and hits them. Um, we really saw him do that exceptionally well in college at Florida, and we did see him return punts and kicks, and he was really good at it. So I, I do think that he can be the punt returner. You know, he isn't wide receiver one for us, so, you know, he's wide receiver three at this point. You know, he'll work his way up, but right now he is WR3, and he is arguably our best tackle breaker, so I do think that, you know, he can be that dynamic punt returner that we're looking for um, because he can catch it and he can absolutely run with it. So I think that he's my option there. Uh, punt returner kick returning is a little bit different usually um, the Giants like to go with a running back there I do think that's why they signed Corey Clement I think that he ultimately makes the roster as the kick returner at least and a backup running back so those are going to be my predictions I think main punt returner Kadarius Toney um, and then main kick returner I do think is going to be Corey Clement um, if he's able to make the 53 which I think he will because of his ability to return kicks he did that a lot with Philadelphia so um, I think that's ultimately what you see end up ending up as your special teams returners and um, I'm curious to see how Corey Clement does there if he does end up securing that position yeah I just picture John Ross if he can catch the ball on punts just using that speed but it's not my favorite yeah. Um, Corey Clement, though, that does make a lot of sense to me. Um, I think that's that's a good that's a good point to to offer. Uh, but let's move on to the next one, Victor. Really appreciate the voicemail. Uh, we'll try and go in a little bit more detail in another video on the kick return group and you know those players and who really could blow things up on that special teams unit because that's a good topic. So we'll save that. I know it's the dead of the, the off season, so we'll we'll cover that shortly. Um, so great idea there. And the next one uh, didn't leave your name, but a great question. Talk about talk about the Giants' offensive line, which is our biggest weakness that we think. Where you think we're strong, where you think we're weak, guard, tackle. Let me hear about it. Thank you for leaving this voicemail, as always. And I personally think we have strengths at left tackle because just simply based on the fact that he's a he was a rookie last year and Andrew Thomas, I feel good about him going into this season. Uh, left guard, I I don't want to coin it a strength, but I'm confident it'll it'll be adequate at best, um, at least. And with Will Hernandez, center, I feel that's a strength. I feel as though Nick Gates is going to be a strength for us moving forward at center. And right tackle and right guard are really my biggest concerns. Right guard, who knows what's happening there? Zach Fulton and Shane Lemieux, who really knows what's going on in that position? Um, and then obviously right tackle, we have um, Nate Solder and Matt Pert. So those two positions are my biggest worries. But I'll tell you what, I'm pretty confident in Matt Pert. I've been looking and watching him lately, uh, and I saw a couple clips against Washington. Even he was playing at left tackle and right tackle. He shut down Chase Young when he had the opportunity, and um, he was playing phenomenally. You know, he was doing really, really well when he was on the when he was on the field, and he, he even pancaked. Uh, I think it was Ryan Kerrigan, which was pretty impressive. So for the most part, I was impressed with what he did. The experience is great. He added a bit of muscle mass. I think he's going to beat out Nate Solder, who I think will end up being a swing tackle for us and just covering any injuries if need be, which is which is exactly what I want him to do. I, I really want Matt Parrott to win this position battle. And then right guard, that's my biggest concern. I have no idea what's going to happen there. Shane Lemieux, we're hoping, takes a massive step, but very unlikely it takes that kind of big of a step. Zach Fulton, he let up the most sacks in the NFL last year, but again, it wasn't all his fault. Houston had just an awful offensive line and Deshaun Watson um, is coined as a he's a quarterback who kind of gets sacked a lot because he runs around in the pocket so much and doesn't really stand there and um, operate well at times but he's so good on the run so that's just a style of play and it works phenomenally it doesn't the sack the sack count doesn't matter if you're scoring points at the end of the day so um, what I will say is that I think the Giants might consider bringing in another another player during camp, whether it's Trey Turner or somebody else that gets cut. But right guard's my biggest scare, and right tackle, I, I feel good about it. I'm not. I feel optimistic. I'm not going to guarantee anything, but I feel optimistic about it, Anthony. So when you're looking at this, what do you think we have strengths and what do you think we have weaknesses? 
I'm going to say strength at center. I like Nick Gates a lot. I think that he steps into his second season as a full-time starting center and does a phenomenal job because he was a guy who played right tackle, right guard in his rookie year and moved all the way into center. And he was really impressive. He, he had that tenacity that you want from a center. He had that you know physicality and that leadership capability. Um, and he was pretty good. He was arguably our best offensive lineman last season. And he was playing a brand new position. He was basically like a rookie. So I think in his second season, more refined coaching staff, you know, more continuity um, with Robert Sale being the offensive line coach. I think he does a really good job. And then, of course, as Alex mentioned, Andrew Thomas, year two. I'm really high on him. I think he has a huge breakout season. And, of course, at right tackle as well, I'm very high on Matt Pair. I think he has a breakout season, establishes, him, establishes his himself as the starting right tackle. So where am I concerned? Both guards, guard positions. I'm very skeptical on Will Hernandez. I think he has the chance to step forward and return to form. But I don't know, man. He's been regressing year after year. It's a big question mark there. Of course, the other guard position is also a question mark. Shane Lemieux is a huge question mark to me. I thought he was horrific in pass protection. Decent enough in run blocking. But, you know, got to be a better pass protector, especially when we're talking about how important this season is for Daniel Jones. So, Zach Fulton, Shane Lemieux. I don't know. I'm very scared by both guard positions, to be completely honest. Um, and I, I'm afraid of what that can do to the tackles and to the center because those guys are sandwiched in between the tackles and center. So I don't know if they're going to be the downfall of the Giants' offense or not. Maybe they will take a step forward. Maybe the new offensive line coach is the truth, and he just whips them into shape and makes them awesome offensive linemen. But that's where my concern is, is with the offensive guards. I feel pretty confident in these young tackles. I think they're going to continue to develop and grow and become solid starters in the NFL. And I am really high on Nick Gates. I love what he did last season. I think he's going to continue to improve and be a very quality starting center. So that's really my take on the offensive line. Crash course real quick there. But, you know, very scared of this offensive guard situation. That much I can um, assure you of. Exactly, guys. So that's it for the voicemails today. Uh, you know, some great questions from you guys. So thank you so much for tuning in and, and really, um, you know, leaving these fan mail back questions for us. You know, this is this is why we do it, to give back to the community and also make you guys uh, heard. We want your voice to be heard on this channel. And that is a big, big priority for us. So we're going to continue doing this every Monday. Leave your voicemails throughout the week. And I'll be, we'll be taking them every Monday and we'll be, you know, distributing them out and, and really answering your questions. We'll even spin off a couple of them and make some full videos on your ideas. And I'll make sure to give you credit for that too. Um, especially, you know, that kick returner one was a great question by Victor there. So I think we'll take a look into that. We'll look at a couple of players who had some success in college and, you know, why we think they would be such kick returners. Uh, Kadarius Tony, obviously 35% missed tackle rate last year, led the all rookie receivers in that category. Um, so that's a huge, obvious one that we can point out and say the guy should be returning kicks, like no question questions asked. Uh, but again, you know, players do get injured that way. Jabril Peppers got injured that way against Chicago a couple years ago, and he ended up missing like half, the, uh, not maybe not half the season, but a couple games. Um, and, you know, it, it becomes a problem sometimes. You don't always want to use your best players in that facet. But guys, thank you so much for tuning into Fireside Giants and leaving these voicemails and interacting with us. As always, it's, it's much appreciated. We love you guys for that. Um, make sure to subscribe below on YouTube and turn your notifications on on Apple and Spotify. As always, my friend, have a fantastic week ahead. Obviously, Obviously, every single day, content coming out, so you can expect that. Maybe we'll do a live stream this week and just hang out and talk shop and, and BS with you guys and have some fun. Um, but as always, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll catch you guys on the next video.